I'm just going to bring him up. Jim, come up here. Come on. Come on. Jim Wilson. Jim Wilson. Let's hear for him. The legend. Now. Getting a barking round of applause. Yes. Have a seat. I know you're a cat person, but. We all remember we, too. Wait, where, where's. Huh? Oh. <laughs> Thank God for Josh. Josh knows where Feelings. I keep a microphone. All right, so, um, I, Jim, I, you know, I've poured through this. I've actually made assiduous notes on, on your book, and that's what we we're here notes. to talk about. We're here to promote your book. It's a little too late to revise, so I'm just letting you know. <laughs> it's mass. Oh. And the original title was Richard Gibbs Presents a Jim Wilson Memoir. Yeah. Tuned in. It didn't fly well in Des Moines, so I'm really sorry about that. I, I had no control, but... I, I, I'm really, I'm bummed. I'm really bummed. Well, that'll be the second edition. Right? But if you look at this edge here, you can see really faintly it says "Giblet Rules." <laughs> That's his nickname for me. Let's not spread that. So we, we go all the way back to our original hairlines. So yeah. that's. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I first met you with uh, through Carrie Hatch, right? Wasn't it? I think so, yeah. The bass player in Boingo introduced you to me. Right. And this, the, the first chapter in this, but this is his, uh, how, how, did, uh, how did he say it uh, like the, uh, in Burn After Reading? My memoir. Memoir. My memoir. I, I debated even using the word memoir just because it has such a pretentious kind of Well, thing. this is a like very pretentious book. <laughs> <laughs> At two brute? Yes. So it, yeah. it's... Um, you start out with a chapter, which is a great way to start with Paul McCartney. A little prologue. Yeah, and, and how that happened, and with Midias. Now, we have a mixed bag here of, how many people here are musicians? Watch this. Okay, how many are not musicians? Okay, we're going to talk to you guys right now for a <laughs> second. So we'll, we'll, we'll kind of get, let's give them a quick idea of what MIDI is for starters. I know we're okay. working backwards, but. We are working. Well. To kind of the predecessor to that is you said to start off with me hanging out on the same piano bench as Paul McCartney. Yes. This, this magical four hour hang, uh, singing Beatles songs and him telling me Beatles stories and and this incredible conversation at the end of which he says. You were, you were correcting he, some of his chordal choices uh, too, were you not? <laughs> yes, I did. Pretentious, <laughs> cheeky bastard that I am. At the end of that four-hour hang, it goes, anytime you're in the UK, just, just give us a bell. Yes, yes. And uh, so in the limo ride on the way back to London, I'm thinking, how the fuck does an insecure West Texas kid end up here and then, and then ultimately, you know, road trips with Carol King and horseback riding with Fogelberg? And the book is about those things. But to, so, so that's kind of how the, the premise of the whole book is <laughs> how does a knucklehead you know, who's prone to panic attacks, who's, you know... Are you panicking uh, at you? Yes. Okay, just good. Sitting, but just look in your eyes. <laughs> yeah. I'm good. So, um, so then we kind of back up from there. That's the prologue of this incredible uh, Journey. beginning. Well, yeah, it's just, you know... Yeah. And, the, you know, Lemurized with the Bells and John. And <clears throat> so I kind of traced it all the way back to... When I was a kid, my mom says, you want to go on an errand with me? I said, sure. So... So I go with her, and she's talking with this grown-up friend of hers, and they're, they're talking grown-up talk and drinking the Chardonnay and everything, and I'm a bored seven-year-old, and I see this guitar over in the corner. And I go over, and I pick it up, and I start plucking around on it. And when we were leaving, this guy says, Hey, I saw you plucking around on that guitar. Did you like it? I said, Yeah, it's cool. He goes, Take it. It's yours. And with that... He changed the direction of my whole life. Yeah. Just this one little gesture. Yeah. And um, in the book, I, that's one of the themes, is called The Power of One. When one moment can change your whole destiny. And there are four such instances in the book, but that was the first one where... Yeah, you've had a lot of one moments. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, yes, but I mean, but the power of one, the idea there is, is the capacity to, for this one little moment, this one gesture, this one random meeting to like, boom, take your whole life in a different direction. Yes, sir, you, you in the back with your hand up. Yeah. Yes. Um, you have a question, sir? Yes. 
Do you need to go to the bathroom? The bathroom's no, no, back here, no, Phil. No, I'm fine. No, I do have a question about that because that's really moving. Now, this was a music store? No, no, no. No, the, the guitar? Yeah. No, it was my mom uh, going over to her friend's house. She needed to, she, they're both in art class, and um, she's borrowed some tools from brushes or something. Let's go. I need to return these to this guy whose name is Toy. So Already she borrows a, art stuff from Toy. Toy. So yeah. we go we drop it off, and they're having this conversation, and he sees me plunking around on this guitar, and take it. It's yours. And that's that whole idea of, you know, it, dig the higher levels of that, those four words, you know, take it, it's yours, but also whatever you want in life, take it, yeah. it's yours. You know? Did you find out later that that really didn't even belong to Toy? And you just... It did, and th and that was it was stolen. The police showed up. I did time in juvie, and it was it's all and, fucked and, up. And, I'm just but, fuck and, you, and, Toy. You know what I mean? Here you are today, asshole. What a fuck? It did change your life. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, the, what I was referring to was this whole thing of MIDI, which yeah. I know is, is uh, I'm starting extremely technical. Yeah. To the people who yeah. aren't musicians. It's it's this, that's how I came to you is because of MIDI because you installed yeah. MIDI in my piano. Yeah. Now that sounds to those of you who aren't musicians that sounds incredibly perverted, it, <laughs> and, and and it is. <laughs> so MIDI stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface. Yeah. And what what brought Jim that one month, that one little piece of technology yeah. is what took you around the world. Yeah. Really with yeah. everybody. Here's here's another power of one moment. So I'm tuning the piano on, guys remember a show called Name That Tune? Any, any sure. old geezers like me who would know that one? Tuning the piano, I'm on the set, it's a quiet set at Sunset Gower, and I'm kind of late to Bill Schnee's recording studio. The next session after that, it's like, but I see this guy setting up a Fender Rhodes. Any musos here have the Dino My thing on their Rhodes piano? Class, class, anyone? Bueller? <laughs> Allison does. Um, anyway, there was this really popular modification you could do to your Fender Rose. It would make it really bright and crispy, and it was... It I, was re I refused to do it because everybody did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was, I mean, yeah, you it listen back, and it's a little, yeah. little extra crispy now. Yeah. It's like, oh, okay. But that was the sound. And I'm, I'm tuning the piano, and I think... I'd heard about this guy, Chuck Monty, and this is the days before the Internet. And I didn't really even know what he looked like, but I thought, I wonder if that's Chuck Monty. God, he's, I would love to meet him. Stopped what I was doing, went over, introduced myself. Just that one little moment would lead ultimately to me helping develop the original MIDI adapter for acoustic piano, which led to the whole rest of the magic carpet ride. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, and that's what's so, now just to digress a moment for the non-musicians. Yeah. It's what this adapter does. It's a complicated in installation, but when you're playing your piano and you can install it just about any piano, um, it outputs MIDI information, which is basically computer code, computer information that can then be translated to synthesizers or recorded in a computer. Right. And, and so you can control any number of instruments from your piano. And which has then morphed to the next level of now they have pianos that are player pianos. You can put MIDI back into the piano. MIDI out, in yeah. and out. But this original one was just the out. The original one, and the reason that this, this came about is because the whole, any musos or non-musos here, there's a company called Sequential Circuits and another one called Roland. And these two, the heads of each of these companies were kind of talking to each other and going, wouldn't it be cool if we had some kind of way for, for my synthesizer to talk to your synthesizer? And it was kind of a revolutionary thing. It's like, why would we want to, doesn't that take away? From, no, it adds to the whole thing and, and this connectivity. So to my good fortune, Steve Solani was working at Sequential Circuits. He got wind of this new thing that was going to be called MIDI, Musical Instrument Digital Interface. And Steve thought, I'm just going to take some of these switches and put them under the piano key. This is before MIDI protocol was even fully announced and before the DX7. So he heard about me through this guy Chuck Monty. I got flown up to San Jose a number of times. 
great switches, they need to be lower profile. I was a piano tech who said, well, here's how this can work in a piano. And they were the electronics geniuses, but somehow or another, I became sort of masthead and I was the only guy on the planet you could get this thing from and got flown to England a dozen times by all these legends and magic carpet ride. Yeah, so that, and, and you, that's how you met me. <laughs> yeah. That's why you're here now. And I, I did say, you didn't hear me under my breath say, Paul McCartney, Elton John, Richard Gibbs. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I, I, I remain insulted, Jim. No, I think the order, you've got the order wrong. <laughs> yeah, thank, thanks, Phil. <laughs> yeah. So, all right, so that, that was the, that was really, I mean, before that you were merely a piano tuner and tech. Yeah. Not, not that that's not a great accomplishment, yeah. but there were a lot of guys who were doing that. But yeah. what you did was set you, that set you way apart from everybody else. No question. And that's hashtag grateful. Yes. And uh, hence you working with Elton John and, you know, they're flying you all over the world to yeah. do this because yeah. you were the only guy. Yeah. So I, I, now I'm going to go someplace you're not expecting. Here's the gotcha moment. Here. I mean, we've known each other since like 1984, maybe five. Yeah. yeah somewhere in right. there. Yeah. It was, um, so. We've known each other a long time. You've tuned my pianos. You've installed all sorts of stuff in all my pianos. Mm -hmm. By the way, you know you can, he actually puts a, a water bucket under your piano for you. <laughs> it's a whole nother thing. And you talk to him later about why you would do that. Observe the looks of just bewilderment. complete bewilderment. It's like, yes. <laughs> what? Why, why would he do that? So, so um, somewhere when I'm reading this book, what struck me that had never, as long as we've known each other and yeah. swapped stories and told horror stories and great stories about all yeah. the people we've worked with and everything yeah. else, I never really made the connection of all the emotional mm. confluences we have. Okay. So I'll start with this. Both your parents yeah. um, lost their childhood homes in fire. That's right. And I just lost my home in fire. My kids lost their childhood home in fire just yeah. now. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Your, your, now I'm going heavy here, but yeah. your little brother, who you adored, yeah. uh, died of a heroin overdose. Yeah. And my, my brother, who, my big brother that I looked up to my whole life, had a complete breakdown due to drugs at Cornell. And has, he didn't die, but he's never come back. Wow. Yeah. So the, these, so we, and we're both the, the products of broken homes. Yeah. And yeah. thoroughly broken homes in both cases. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, you know, it, it just struck me like how much that has affected our lives, mm. just as much as the positive stuff. You know, the dark stuff is what is where yeah. that's where, where the character is, right? Yes. And no doubt about it. You know, my my brother dying of a heroin overdose at the age of 23, IQ of 156. That was that was a, a major left hook. Yeah. And and then me as the big brother the role model, it's like, fuck, did he get into that because he saw me, the hippie with the long hair and smoking pot? And so there's always, yeah, you agree. Yeah. There's always the chance to blame yourself for it, and, but you'll probably jump to the, the other death that really changed my life. Go for it. It's my friend Claude Gaudet. Allison, yeah, right? He was a very dear friend of mine. 37 years old, died of a heart attack. And um, my brother dying was a left hook, but, but Claude's dying really, really hit me because I could see how quickly this could just be over in a second, how, how your dreams can vaporize into the atmosphere. And just two months before, he died, I was listening, he was playing this beautiful sonata that he just composed. Mm. And he had this dream of doing, stepping out as an artist. He had had hit songs with Celine Dion, he was David Foster's right hand man, a ranger. And I thought, stand back and watch people. This is how you do it, because we'd get together, we'd have these mastermind sessions, and we'd get up every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 8 a.m. to work out, and just supporting each other's dreams and everything. And then, 
in the hospital, I'm holding his cold hand, and I'm thinking, what the fuck happens to those dreams now? They, I, I got it how, no, you idiot. There's no guarantee of, 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 there's no limitless reservoir of tomorrows. Get the fuck on with it, because this could be over at any second. And I knew that if I got that tap on the shoulder, I wanted to leave something behind. So that was when I said, okay, my original dream of becoming the next Jackson Brown and, and instead becoming the next Jackson Brown piano tuner, uh, that dream now no longer really held true for me. But what did ring true for me was these songs that I, these pieces that I was composing on piano, I just got so much pleasure out of them. No one's gonna ever hear these, but man, when I play this 16th note pattern in B minor and then do the sharp five, it's like, oh God, I love that. And, Pulling some of my James Taylor melodies and some some David Foster and Dave Grusin harmonies and my own little thing. It's like so when Claude died, I thought, okay, uh, I'm gonna record some of these and make them into an album. If I get that tap on the shoulder, time's up, pencils down, turn your in assignments in as is. I wanted to have something that I would leave behind that this is what he was capable of, because I could, saw how quickly that could not happen with Claude. To cut to the chase, that first album, there was a bidding war. I, sent, I, uh, I got a copy of the A&R registry, back in the days of fax, and um, I faxed, faxed the A&R guys saying, just so you know, tomorrow you'll be receiving a package that Carol King, this is where it's nice to have these clients to support me because she really fell in love with my first record. Carol King says, is a magical music carpet ride of melodic beauty. Burt Bacharach says, blah, 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 and et cetera, et cetera. Richard Gibbs says. Richard Gibbs said, this is a piece of shit. He, he can't afford me. <laughs> <laughs> so that little gambit of sending out the facts and then FedExing it, that resulted in all unsolicited, uh, 20 labels I sent it to, seven said yes, four of them put paper on the table. Angel Lee and I, ultimately, Division of Capital Records, eventually ponied up this huge advance, and that one made it to number 21 on the Billboard New Age charts. A little allergic. <laughs> the ultimate endorsement right there, right? Uh, and then now here I am, 10 albums later, and four times on the Billboard charts and 75 million streams of my music and two PBS specials and getting to hang with my buddy Richard Gibbs here on a Monday morning. Yep. Okay, now, now I'm going to keep flipping around commonalities we have. Oh, great. Cindy Wood. No, I don't have that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, He's Jim. talking my very first California girlfriend. Oh, it's a good first California girlfriend to have. <laughs> Any of you have seen Apocalypse Now, Cindy Wood was the beautiful blonde who comes out of the helicopter and puts on a show and creates a riot in Vietnam. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I did actually meet her once, probably yeah. when you were dating her. Wow. She said, are you available? Because like, this guy Jim's not happening. And I said, no, I'm <laughs> he sorry. Ain't, I'm, he ain't I'm cutting taking. the mustard. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but, um, but what, the reason I bring up Cindy is that she brought you into the coolest gig I think you've ever had. So... I, I want to see video of this, or at least a good photo. There's a picture in the book. Yeah, yeah but it's not, it's not the real thing. <laughs> Jim Wilson used to play piano with his shirt off at Chippendales. <laughs> <laughs> and he was the Chippendales warm-up act. Is that essentially correct? There, yeah, yeah. Not, not piano, but a guitar. Okay, fair. Not me, right. but somebody else, and it wasn't Chippendales, so... He, other than you that, said Chippendales. Yeah, no, in the I'm book. teasing. I'm teasing. Yeah. Uh, so Cindy became my biggest champion, and and um, she had heard. She was also a playmate herself. So. Playmate of the year. Yes. For, yes. Forgive me. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Try that as your very first California girlfriend experience, and that'll fuck you up for the rest of your California stay. Um, but um, so she she uh, knew about this new club called Chippendales. And the regular entertainer there who warmed up the audience for the, you know, as the women are getting drunk and rowdy, he would play guitar and, and sing. And 
Well, he was going to take a two-week break, and Cindy says to the owner, who she, she knew everybody, my boyfriend's, he's great. And it's like, oh, fuck, Cindy, what have you got me into? That's, that's not my thing. So I quickly had to work up on guitar. Uh, Hot-blooded, check it and see. And then some other things that are not in my wheelhouse, but... As it turns out, I could have read, you know, to be or not to be, and it would have made no difference because they were drunk and they were ready for those dancers. And so I'm, they were ready for you too, <laughs> according to the book. Uh, and so the night before, she says, "Oh, by the way, it's you can't wear a shirt." It's like, oh, fuck, I'm gonna suck in my belly the whole time. Are you kidding? So you take a a white shirt, cut out the collar, and put a little bow tie and. Yeah, so it's a, the, that was my Chippendales debut, and all these women were coming up, and they were just, it was horrible. What were they doing, Jim? <laughs> <laughs> Hands all over me. It's like, oh, God, I'm just revolted by this, man. Yeah, yeah right. I'm a, I'm a man. I have my own dignity, for fuck's sake. Yeah, yeah. I experience that every day, Jim. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> all right, um, so, I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm, I'm assuming that there's going to be some questions that come in here, and uh, Jim... So this is the book. That's what we're here to promote for everybody. So get one of these. A hard cover. You uh, sent me a soft cover. <laughs> well, Dude. Gonna... Oh, my God. Uh, I didn't know it came out in hard uh, cover. Here, we'll trade. Okay. This is uh, in case anybody wants to enter the contest. I think you we're, had we're gonna, an idea. Okay. Right, here, here's the question. I haven't done this in a long time. Who drove here this morning from the furthest away? Jim wants his own book back. What? Okay, uh, let's. Santa Barbara. Did anybody beat Santa Barbara? Did you drive from Santa Cruz today? Santa Clarita? No, Santa Barbara's got you beat. Where'd you come from? Not for, this for morning. Today? You didn't. Look, no. I, I went with the Bali too. That doesn't count. That's not yeah, what I'm saying. I, I, I'm from Ohio, but I didn't yeah, drive. Yeah, there. yeah. Well, where did you wake up this morning? Okay, that that. Wow. Well, so yeah, but but. That's pretty far. I, yeah, I think he's the winner. Yeah. Think, okay, okay, Jim, he wins the book. <laughs> now, Jim will autograph this for you. Later, right, Jim? Yeah. Well, you'll you'll forge my signature, Phil. Of course. Right? Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Oh, you have notes, man. This I is. I have notes. I have. Uh, okay, I covered that one. Jim, oh, you did bring some uh, for real, some books to to um, sell. So, so this has been a four-year marathon. Back in the beginning of the pandemic, I thought, okay, I've got no more excuses. People have been saying, "My God, you're gonna get some of these stories now." So I thought I'd put ten, pen to paper. The whole narrative evolved into a lot more than just entertaining celebrity stories. And part three is when my friend Claude dies and they go, okay, get on with my dreams. And it's about me just tuning in to my particular artistry. What am, who am I? And, you know, taking that bold step as an, as an artist. So this four-year marathon of writing and, and refining and all the other things that go along with it ends tomorrow. There's a whole nother marathon that begins after that, but the book has been on uh, available for pre-order for three months, <clears throat> and um, tomorrow is the day of the release. I see. So we, you don't, yeah, we can't get books ne right now from you. You can, you can go on Amazon. There are flyers here and there. Okay. And there's some as you leave if you want, but uh, it's available for pre-order, and you'll, you'll get it. You know. You can see tomorrow. what kind of storyteller he is in person. So uh, make no mistake, the book will be incredible. So I highly recommend it. Thank you, well, sir. I, Thank you. I got a kick out of one story, several stories, okay. obviously. But um, this, because we've, I've had this experience, and almost anybody in the music industry has had some version of the experiences that are in this book. Okay. And the one I'm referring to is the story of Perry. <laughs> yes. Because, and, and, and now yeah. those of you who are in other industries and aren't in entertainment, don't, there aren't a whole lot of people who pretend to be architects, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> exactly. You know, yeah. or, you know or, or, or fake doctors or plumbers or anything, or accountants or anything else. 
Every well, single day. Well, that's different. Um, you're, you're just saying in terms of quality. I'm saying there's fraud and bizarre fraud yeah. that happens. All, and I've had, I had a very similar experience. But I'm going to tell my story before you tell yours. Yeah, okay. And, yeah, so and there. mine was that early on when I first came here, just like you, early, early in my career, somebody calls me up and says, hey, um, uh, I'm putting together a band for the singer from the... Um, um, no, not... not uh, who, pick up the pieces. Who was that? Uh, average, uh, average White average Band. Average White Band. Band. Hamish the, Stewart. And, yeah. yeah, the singer from the Average White Band. Now, that was all kind of gang vocals. Right, right. yeah, that's know? right. And so I think, well, okay, we're putting together a band for the singer for Average White Band. Would you be interested in playing keys? I go, sure. And I said, well, we're looking, what else do you need? And he said, well, a whole band. I said, I'll put the whole band together for you. I assembled a whole band for this guy, and I show up at a rehearsal hall in North Hollywood, and I had uh, Mark Stevens, Shaka's Little Brothers, right, playing right, bass, and right. all these guys. And, um, and the guy shows up, and I'm looking at now, I don't know what the singer in the average white band looks like. <laughs> right, right. Right? And he's a young guy. It could be. But, and he shows up and he distributes the music, but it's, it's like piano, I mean, store-bought, dime store <laughs> right, right. music. It's not the, the off, charts off the, that you and I are used to seeing. Yeah, yeah it's off-the-shelf stuff that he had you know, Purchase Xeroxed, that. Oh, right? Nice. And he's handing that out as a music. Well, that's weird for starters. And then, so we're starting to run through the tunes, and he's kind of standing over in the corner holding the mic. We go, oh, sore throat, man, sore throat. Oh. And it turned out the whole thing was a complete scam for no fucking reason. <laughs> it made no sense whatsoever. There was some, some guy that ran a liquor store that had met this kid and said, I'll make you a star. Uh. <laughs> and and they and they were tr and the only reason I found out is a sax player showed up. My friend Doug Norwine shows up, and he looks. He goes, "I've seen the average white." Can I talk to you? And he pulls me out. That's not the singer in the average white band. Are you sure? And he pulls out an album cover. Right. And I was like, "Yeah, I don't recognize any of these guys. This yeah. isn't it." So, so you had the similar yeah. bizarre experience yeah. with somebody named Perry. So I was playing in a band back in Texas, and um, both keyboard players in two different bands I was playing in, Katoon Pianos, that's where I got the original idea. That's a little PS. Uh, nice way to go out and make 25 bucks. Um, but in the well, band- You charge me a lot more than that, Jim. <laughs> $26, in oh. fairness. Uh, you, can, you can afford it. Um, so the, we were kind of a big deal in the Texas Panhandle, band called Easy. The irony of the name is not lost on me because we were. And uh, this this guy, there's a lot of sycophants who come in when you're, you know, playing in a band and do the hot stuff, and everybody wants to pal up with the band. Well, this one guy kept coming in, and and um, one night he showed up with a, a sports jersey, and on the back of it it said Manilow. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, I just got back from <clears throat> Las Vegas, as with my brother, and uh, and he introduced himself as Perry, and his. His brother, yeah, his brother, Barry? Barry? Barry's your, yeah, yeah, I've told him about you guys, man. He's, he was really into you guys. He wants to meet you guys. And By the way, I'm part owner of the uh, Frontier Hotel in Las Vegas. I think you guys would be great there. And we got a, not the main stage, you know, but we got another room that you guys would do great. It's a couple thousand people. It would be amazing. So this guy was, like, leading us on. We're going, holy shit, man, Barry, man, hello. And then Perry... Manilow came in and and he had an album and uh, it was he, it, from Barry. It was signed by Barry. It's like Jim, leader of the pack? Question mark. Love Barry. It's a little inside joke. Oh my God, Barry Manilow is on my radar. I'm on his radar. It's incredible. Then suddenly, as the Frontier Hotel gig got a little closer and closer, Perry vanishes. It's like, wait, we're this close. Turns out he was the brother of the local TV weatherman and he had some issues with schizophrenia and uh, so that went up in flames and it would turn out that I had some demons of my own that I was about to confront because there was the next chapter that follows that is about me just about going into the abyss in this near suicide attempt and Got heavy. How's that for a nice little yeah, happy yeah, button? Yeah, bring us right down, Jim. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, to say all that to say yeah. that I don't pull any punches, and I, I try to 
no, bleed, this is bleed a, a journey. Bit. This yeah. this book is a journey. Yeah. The whole story of, of everything you went through yeah. um, from youth to now. Yeah. Everything's covered in there except, except for your relationship with me. But it's anyway. good. Um, so, uh, by the way, anybody has any questions? Now's a good time. Oh, and there we go. Wow. Uh, Phil, yeah. Phil's working. I got you. Raise and, your hand. There you are. And real quick, Jim, while, while the, Phil's bringing the mic around. Yeah. Elton John. Tell us about Elton John. He's the singer. Perhaps you've heard of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a little bit I'm just, funny. I just wonder why you brought him up. Who is this guy? <laughs> Um, what an amazing artist and what an incredible time to share with, with him and limo rides with him. And the one quick little thing was I've gotten to know him pretty well over the years after admitting his piano, went to his home and a couple of a number of other places. And he was doing a rehearsal at the complex down here and he knew that I cared for the piano that he had given Bonnie Raitt. They, he and uh, Bonnie were having lunch, and she said, "On a whim, yeah." Yeah, and he says, "She goes, yeah, I'd really love to have a piano one day." He goes, "Excuse me," goes makes a phone call. She goes home. There's a piano in her living room. Yeah. Courtesy of El. Thank you, Elton. Yeah. Uh, but he happened to know that I cared for that piano, and he said, "Yeah, so a few of us are going to go hear Bonnie this Sunday night. You want to join us?" He's like, uh, "Let me. See. I'm doing my laundry that night, but I can." So I showed up the Four Seasons hotel in the penthouse suite of course and Elton and me and a couple of other people and there's a piano there and he's playing the songs for us and it's like fuck this is insane he would go over to the balcony look down there's the limo and he'd come back play another song and kept going back and finally <laughs> he came back and okay we're ready he was waiting on the police escort that was going to take us so we're going from the Four Seasons over to the Hollywood Bowl and the limo Police escort. Elton and Jim coming through. People clear the fucking streets. Get out of the way. <laughs> so I, I said, God, this is incredible. This, I guess you do this for security? He goes, no, I just hate traffic. <laughs> <laughs> we, had a, we had a question. Right here. Here we Jim, go. I'm curious to know if the guitar you were given when you were seven years old is hmm. still yours. And if not, what happened to it? What's your name? I'm David. David, the... The significance of that, David, didn't really hit me in until later. The answer is no, sadly. And, and, and I went on to a little bit better guitar, and it, it evolved into a different thing. But, you know, it's like one of those things, God, I wish I'd had that guitar. I also wish I could go back and tell Toy, dude, you, you don't know it, but you changed my life. Yeah. So um, was it just left behind in the house? You moved to a different place? Or yeah. Or did you give it to somebody? <laughs> left behind, and, you know... It's, it's one of those things you don't really realize it, David, until you're sort of looking back decades later. You go, Jesus, man, that was, that was something. That really changed my world. I have a pun for that guitar so that my guitar gently weeps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it's fun when I'm reading the book again, the, the commonalities are yeah. everybody in this room of a certain age has the same experience of watching the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. Oh. And now they just changed. Oh, oh, the world just changed. Yeah, yeah. We have to do something different now. Tectonic shift. Yeah, and I used to. I started. I started a little mime group in elementary school, yeah. and we would put on a forty-five and get up in front of the second and third graders, and mime. You know, I want to hold your hand yeah, and do all yeah. this stuff. And I got the role of the Paul McCartney part, so I learned left left-handed wow. miming. Yeah. Air guitar, right. left-handed. <laughs> okay. And I got my first guitar, and I yeah. tried to play it left. I, that's all I knew. Yeah. And I had to, it, and finally got a, a real lesson. So, well, first off, are you right-handed? Yeah. Well, what are you doing? And I had to <laughs> rewire my brain, you know? <laughs> Classic. So it's, it's all Paul's fault. Someday I'll yeah. tell him about that. Damn, man. All right. So, all right, do you have more? More questions. Yeah, we have a Zoom question. All right. Okay. Ronnie? Hi, uh, thanks for being on. Uh, yeah, thank I wanted you. to know about the indie, the, the uh, yeah. when you were at six sequential circuits. Who were who were the people that actually established the MIDI? Was it was it sequential? I know sequential circuits and a guy named Jet Wood was there. Okay. I don't know because it got formed and it was like a big free for all for a while at the first. That's right. Yeah. So. 
this, that was my question. I don't know. Kind of convoluted question. Well, no, no. Um, all I know is that the the CEOs of the I don't know what happened. Dave at, Smith, right? At, yeah. Dave Smith, and then was uh, and Talk Roland was a Japanese name. Yeah, do talk about are you yeah, got yeah, it in this, your book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that those two had this wonderful brainchild of you know God, what if what if we could actually instead of being in competition, we could kind of find a way to to network our computers. And I'm not sure who was part of that. A good friend of mine is now part of MIDI 2.0, and and I see now what the, the whole committee. Uh, mindset is like, and it's no, it should do this, it should do that, and they're trying to go for a higher resolution of of MIDI, and instead of 127 increments, like a thousand. So that's on the horizon, but it's uh, it takes forever to get past that group mindset. Well, one of the guys from Roland, a buddy of mine, is going to come and speak, and Roland has a new initiative all around AI, and they've they've got their own. Um, ethos that they've come up with he's yeah. going to come speak about what roland is doing vis-a-vis -vis ai Oof. that's good that's coming up in a couple months so cool we have a question here go ahead um so at the beginning uh you were talking about the one kind of like you power of maybe, one, one yeah, power of one yeah so i i wonder uh like uh as some as you kind of say that's something that defines you i'm wondering uh you know, in some way, every single moment is yeah. one of those. It can be. How have you seen? That's I, that, I guess that's kind of my question. Like, how have you seen those relationships play out? Like these huge defining moments of the guy giving you the guitar, going Paul McCartney. Right. How much has the moments that are like these? Because every single you know moment is a moment. How much of those in between ones affected you as much as the big ones? I guess. Uh, you know. What's your name? I'm Drew. Drew. Yeah. Um, they should, Drew, and, and every, <laughs> to be fully present in the moment, you know, that should be the goal, and, and I struggle with that, you know, in my book I talk about panic attacks and everything, and I know that when I just kind of, it, it's kind of like being on the side of a swimming pool, and you're going to jump in, and you know it's going to be cold, and, and you, uh, you avoid it, you avoid it, and then you jump in, you go, oh, wait, I, I know how to swim, and fuck, this water's refreshing now, you know? So it's kind of like that. If, if um, the more I'm on the sidelines, the more I'm prone to panic attacks, the more I'm, you know, not fully in the moment. But um, that's kind of around where you're going with that a little bit. But, but yeah, in some of those power of one moments, they don't really register with you until after the fact. And in retrospect, you're looking back and going, Jesus, man, that... That one little thing, that decision to, to get up and say, Hi, sure. I'm, you know, introduce myself, yeah. change me. Jim, we have a question here. I, I'm going to guess that the power decisions. of one for you is when you found that jacket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Martin. Speaking of decisions, Jim. Yeah, yeah Martin. Um, uh, I look forward to reading your book. Thank you. I'm not sure if it's for prurient reasons or personal reasons, or I just like All stories. the above, all of them, Martin. Um, some of you know this about me, so uh, since you shared, well, to digress. Ask the question, ask the question, Martin. <laughs> and now hold the mic like this. Yeah. Just, <laughs> no. What was the dance with suicide mm. um, premeditated? And by that I mean, w w was it just like, oh, that day you decided, or had whatever was brewing been brewing for a long time? And are you, uh, you can't be embarrassed. Um, no. Because you wrote the book. Yeah. But, but it's not easy to write about that, and you have to kind of. I lost a son to suicide. That's uh, why I asked. I'm Maybe so this sorry. would benefit others. I'm so sorry. Um, part of the perfect storm that kind of led to that moment was. Um, I was playing in a band, and this girl danced a little too close to the stage. And I got a phone call a couple of months later, finding out that I was going to be a father. And I was a 19-year-old, freewheeling, irresponsible kid. And I'm a much older, irresponsible kid. And um, But back in, the, in that era, <clears throat> we, we went to go do a gig, and and I was I was coming down with the flu, and that kind of fucks up your your perception and this whole thing of oh my god i'm gonna be a, a dad i don't want that and 
P.S. It turned out to be the greatest blessing in my life. I, get, I show pictures of my grandkids to people all the time, and it's like, and, and there is, I, I came so close to the abyss because I, I literally just, you know, after the gig, I'm, I'm going to go to my hotel room. I'm going to, there's the soup, there's the sleeping pills. I'm going to, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but this is, this is the new delirious normal, and I, I can't deal with this. permanent solution to a temporary situation and and I thank you Martin for your yeah. question yeah one, one last question sorry it's the clapping <laughs> if you guys didn't know Shiloh it's okay um I I <laughs> dad okay anyway this is my dog this is my emotional support Shiloh, dog. yes um I've I've had my own dance with certain things, and I was curious who helped you here, or if it, wherever it was. Um, I had to step out a few times because of my dog, and I was just curious yeah. who helped you, what are your resources, and what um, that, do you feel passionate about helping others with things that you've experienced? And resources in what way? What human who, resources? Human resources. Who, who helped you? Who, who helped you? Right. It does take a village, and you know we're everything that's good that's come to me in my life has been via other people. You know, so your your relationships with other people. It just so happens that I had done a thirty day resident program in Berkeley. I went from Texas because I'd read this book called Handbook to Higher Consciousness by Ken Casey. Oh wow! And so I went to there and. And as in my facing the abyss, I remembered the Living Love Center in Berkeley. And I called, it was the middle of the night, some kind soul picked up the phone, thank God. And he kind of started walking me through. It's like, okay, so if that happened, would you still be alive? And so what's the worst that could happen? That was the, as he peeled the layers of the onion. Was, and then as you kind of realize, Jesus, I'm kind of making a lot out of nothing. And, and it comes back to one of my favorite sayings of all time. I've had a great deal, many troubles in my life, some of which actually happened. Yeah. It's like we, we let those, you know, which, which wolf do you feed, you know, that whole Correct. thing. Correct. Yeah, that's the one. And and if you want to feed the nasty wolf, then go ahead. Yeah. But it's your choice. So I've had a great deal, many troubles in my life, some of which actually happened. So don't let them. They they only have the power that you give them. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's beautiful. Jim, thank you so much for Jim joining. Wilson. Thank you. Buy buy the book. Listen thank to you. the music. Check them out on Spotify and all the other platforms. And if Lord knows if you need a piano tuned, here's the man.